Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another session on financial analysis. And I thought today we would have a look at the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, which, as many of you will know, is in the news at the moment because it has gone bust. And I want to just take a quick look and see if we can see why it's gone bust. Um, so uh, just to kind of introduce, if you are not aware, um, Silicon Valley, here it is. Uh, it's a state chartered commercial bank headquartered in Santa Clara, in California. It failed on the 10th of March 2023 with holdings managed by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So effectively, it was bailed out. So none of the depositors lost any of their money, uh, but the bondholders and the shareholders have been completely wiped out. And what I want to do uh, uh, in this session is just have a quick look at their financial statements to see uh, if we can see why this happened. So um, without further ado, here we go. Let's have a look at their financial statements. So this is their 10K. It's on their website. You can still get it from their website um, uh, uh, if you have a look. At least it, you could when I looked at it. Um, and if we scroll through this 10K, this is the kind of the standard SEC um, uh, reporting document. Um, uh, we will find the kind of the main financial statements um, which give the profit and loss income statement and balance sheet. So here is the balance sheet. We'll start with, we'll start with the income statement um, uh, and talk us through the numbers here. So relatively straightforward income statement. Um, they have got interest income uh, and they get interest income from uh, loans and also from investments. Now, this is quite interesting. Um, they get a lot of interest from their investments. OK, so they are making a loan, um, uh, but they are also making investments. And that is the two sources of their income, about six billion dollars. Um, the cost of generating that is, well, this is what they pay the interest they pay to their deposit holders. That's about eight hundred twenty six million and three hundred twenty six um, in terms of kind of cost of borrowings. Um, uh, and it, that, that's their cost of borrowings. And so their net interest expense is one uh, one point two billion, uh, and so we can see here if we take these two numbers together, we end up with the the net interest income of about four point five billion. So thinking about this, this is very much a commercial bank. They borrow money over here and they lend money over here. Now, in effect, what they're doing is that they're taking money from depositors. They are lending it out, but they're also investing it, and we're going to see that on the balance sheet. Uh, and then we've got all the costs of kind of running the business down here. These are kind of all the sort of the standard. Um, so this is a, a more income, uh, other income and charges. Um, uh, they've got all of their other expense. You know, the big part of expense of any bank is their comp. Uh, that's all the money that they pay, all those big bonuses they pay um, to those very clever bankers. And that leaves them with a, um, a profit at the end of the year. Um, they pay a little bit of tax there. Um, uh, and that's really the kind of, you know, the key. Um, the, the key numbers coming through um, uh, from their income statement. So reasonably profitable bank, um, you know, 1.5, 1.7, 1.2 billion over the past few years, um, all looks fine. Now, if we look at the balance sheet, um, balance sheet is quite interesting. So first of all, um, balance sheet. So if you watch these videos a lot, uh, a bank's balance sheet is slightly different to a kind of corporate balance sheet because they don't make this distinction between current and non-current assets and liabilities. It's just, here's the assets, here's the liabilities. Um, so for a bank, one of the key numbers for a bank is um, this kind of this solvency uh, ratio. Um, so what they look at is here are the total assets, here are the total liabilities. And if we take the difference between the total assets and the total liabilities, it's represented by the equity uh, and that is effectively their kind of their solvency cushion. So if they make a loss, the aim is that the, the equity investors um, uh, pick up that loss uh, and the depositors don't lose any money. So solvency and, and, and you hear about solvency in the regulation um, uh, is, is very, very important. Um, uh, looking at this, you'll also notice that they have things like this long term debt here. So from a solvency point of view, these are people who've lent the bank money. So these are not depositors. They're not people who have opened up a savings account and put some money in there. These are people who said, I am lending you, uh, the, you, the bank, the money. Um, uh, and so in effect, from a solvency point of view, because uh, if you lend money to an organization, you know your money is at risk. You accept that risk. We can treat that. 
as effectively part of the kind of the capital in the business um uh, that uh, and and these guys would have been wiped out by the way so um uh, you know if you were you know part of this you didn't get any money and these guys were completely wiped out as well now what's quite interesting about um this balance sheet is the mix up at the top here in terms of the assets um so the um the liabilities for example we can see um you know a significant part of the the, the liabilities are these deposits so these deposits is um you know people who've just basically deposited money into the bank now um this 530 these people here if you remember um you know they've lent money to the bank and they accept that they may not get their money back that comes with a risk whenever you lend money to an organization you accept there's a risk you're not going to get your money back these guys don't really accept that risk um you know if you deposit your money in your bank it's your money you're just parking it in the bank um uh, you do not accept the risk and, and that's where the kind of this um uh you know the government insurance schemes are sitting around in uh, uh here in the uk we get a regular letter uh, appearing with our bank statement saying by the way uh x i think it's about 75 or 85 thousand pounds of your money is guaranteed so if the bank does go bust you're not going to lose everything okay and that's about providing confidence to these guys these guys need to know that their money is safe in the bank now, what does the company do? What does the bank do with that money? Well, typically, they're going to lend it out. OK, so they do make loans uh, to um, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, other organizations or individuals. And that's the loan book there. Now, that's a relatively small number for a bank. Typically, if you look at your kind of you know, your standard commercial bank, the loan book will be by far the biggest number. So that's a relatively small number. Uh, and what we see that these guys have actually done is just put the money on deposit. OK, now they hold a little bit of cash as well. There's the cash 13 billion. Uh, that's just to kind of, you know, to pay, put money in ATM machines and pay out um, uh, when uh, people need it. But um, these two numbers here, these are the important numbers. OK, so let's look at those numbers in a little bit more detail. We've got two here, which we've called actively for sale securities at fair value and held to held to maturity securities at amortized cost. So in effect, what they're saying is that the 26 billion is the market value of uh, the investments. And, and by securities, they're really talking about bonds, um, uh, which are effectively, you know, ways of lending money to governments and to other organizations. Um, so these will be bonds um, uh, that they have held. And, and they're sort of, you know, they're happy to sell them. So they kind of buy them and sell them. And so they hold them at the market value and if the market value of bonds goes up then that number goes up and if the market value goes down that number goes down okay but bonds typically traditionally um, are not very volatile they don't you know they don't bounce around like share prices a lot okay the held to maturity securities they don't hold those at the at the market value because you know effectively they've got a bond and the bond might say you know we're going to give you the money back in 10 years time and we're all going to get a million dollars in 10 years time what they'll do is they'll hold it at you know a a, a kind of a calculated figure um which reflects that um but it doesn't change okay so it doesn't so, so it, it, it's not what you would and it may be that those bonds are trading at more than 91 billion in the market or they may be trading at less than 91 billion in the market okay now here comes the rub so uh, a lot of um uh, these depositors are uh, entrepreneurs they're kind of silicon valley you know all the kind of the tech guys etc cetera, etc cetera, who are all on these chat rooms and and talking to each other and um uh, the federal reserve has been putting interest rates up recently okay quite significantly so um uh, i think the base rate in the federal in the us right now is about four and a half to 4.75 percent in the uk it's been going up i think it's at four percent now uh, an increase from covid a couple of years ago when it was at 0.1 percent um uh, as i'm speaking the ecb is is kind of on the cusp of meant to be raising interest rates today by another 0.5 percent whether they do uh, we'll see whether like gar has the uh, has the kind of the confidence to be able to do that um and if you raise up interest rates you make money more expensive and that effectively raising interest rates reduces the price of assets now um think about this a little bit like your house for example uh if your house um uh, you know if you want to borrow a million dollars uh, to buy a house 
and the interest rate's gone up. That means your mortgage is going to go up. Your monthly payments have gone up. And therefore, maybe you can't borrow that million dollars. You can only borrow $800,000, for example, in which case, if everybody's in that position, then nobody can afford the million dollar house and the house has to come down. So that's a kind of a, you know, just giving you an example of why if you put interest rates, house prices come down, but bond prices come down and share prices come down as well. So raising interest rates brings asset prices down and lowering interest rates brings asset prices up. Now, interest rates have been falling for about 40 years, not in a straight line, but they have been falling since uh, the uh, 1970s, late 1970s, uh, a period of very high inflation, interest rates have been falling pretty much steadily. And you can kind of Google um, uh, interest rate charts on the uh, internet and, and, and see, um, you know, they kind of bounce around a bit, but there's a definitely a trend, okay? And that's why we've seen, you know, house prices have been going up very significantly over the 40 years, uh, share prices, uh, bond prices, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, now we live in a period of inflation, interest rates are going up. And if interest rates are going up, those prices are now starting to come down, which means those bond prices are going down. So that 26 billion, um, that will be, you know, this is obviously on the 31st of December. Um, this is now in March. That 26 billion will probably be a little bit less. But that 91 billion, well, there's a big question mark over that as to what is that actually worth? OK, well, it doesn't really matter as long as you keep your money in the deposit and you're not going to take it out. And we can treat as long as the the the, um, uh, the bank can treat this as long term money. I, I put the money in there and I'm not going to take it out. And, you know, on the days that some people take it out, other people are putting money in. So on a long term basis, you can see it's pretty much the same. It doesn't really change that much. Then that's fine. However, if you start to have rumors and people on chat rooms going, I'm a little bit nervous about SVB, I think I'll just pop down to the local bank and take my money out and park it somewhere else, you suddenly end up with that this figure down here, these deposits going down. OK, and in order to fund that, these guys are going to need to get some hold of some cash and then they're going to need to start to sell these securities. So these securities which are being held to maturity, suddenly they think I'm not going to be able to hold them to maturity because I'm going to have to sell them in order to fund these withdrawals. Now, the problem here. Uh, so typically in a bank run, the problem comes that this money has been lent out in a long term loan. I, we've lent it to somebody for 25 years. We're not going to get it back for 25 years and therefore we can't pay the depositor straight back. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, Northern Rock, for example, in the UK, global financial crisis and also what happened in the 1929 uh, 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 sort of stock market crash. These guys, it's slightly different because what they're going to have to do is to start to sell these 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 held to secure held to maturity securities, uh, and we're not sure what they're worth. And we're probably thinking they're definitely going to be worth less than that 91 billion because that 91 billion was you know valued when interest rates were very low when we bought them, and now interest rates are much higher. The market value is going to be much lower. It wouldn't be a problem if we held them to maturity, but we've got some funds coming out now. Uh, this kind of rumor starts to work on the chat rooms and suddenly there's a kind of, you know, a little bit of a sort of a sense of, you know, actually, we just need to quietly nip down to the bank and get my money out. Uh, and if there is a bank run, you really need to be first in the queue, because if you're first in the queue, you can get your money out and it's absolutely fine. If you're last in the queue, then you're stuffed and you're not going to get any money. So what you end up with is people are starting to think, well, if everybody else is taking their money out, I need to take my money out as well. And it starts to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's kind of what happened with SVB, that it's, you know, it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy that, that kind of, you know, people have lost, people lost confidence in it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, as a result of losing confidence, there was a bank run um, and it caused um, the company to go bust. Now, the depositors haven't lost any money. That's fantastic. So they are protected here in the UK. Um, the UK arm was uh, bought by HSBC. HSBC's got assets of uh, last time. I've actually done an analysis of HSBC. You can look it up. But I think the, the assets are something like three trillion pounds or something. I mean, it's a, it, or two trillion pounds. It's a really, really big bank. Um, uh, and, you know, you are pretty much as safe as you're going to be anywhere um, by having your money parked in HSBC. Um, Signature Bank has also gone bust. And uh, the markets are kind of trying to work out, is this 2007 all over again? I know at the moment, at the time we're recording this, Credit Suisse, uh, for example, is um, somewhat struggling and uh, people are starting to look and think, you know, <gasps> Uh, and, and the problem with Credit Suisse is, you know, this, this, these guys, I mean, this is total assets, 200 and, uh, 212 
uh, billion dollars. I mean, it's really a very, very small bank. So this is not a particularly um, large bank. And therefore, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not too, well, first of all, it's not too big to fail, but it's also, it's not too big to bail out. Credit Suisse, on the other hand, is a big bank, okay? No, this is a significant bank, um, and this is, you know, much more systemic and will cause a much bigger headache if it does go bust. Now, um, is it going to go bust? I have no idea, uh, but you can start to see that this kind of, you know, knock-on effect of people start to lose confidence in the bank it becomes 2007 all over now the 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 what led to 2007 is, is fundamentally different it was the it was the, uh, the the quality of the loan books sitting on the, a bank's balance balance sheets um and the quality of some of those assets um uh and and, and that and that's where contagion you know really started to take hold and, and i don't my gut feel is that it's not going to happen again but i think it's going to be um you know we Credit Suisse needs to kind of be shored up uh, uh, and make sure that that doesn't um, uh, have a, any kind of sort of ramifications. Um, but I think uh, otherwise, I think we're looking pretty, um, uh, pretty confident. Um, so let's have a look at the share price. So you can see the share price, you know, it kind of went all the way up um, uh, at the end of 2002. Uh, and then um, it, it, it has been falling. So it has been falling. And then, of course, um, it was, uh, you know, I mean, this actually gives a market cap. Obviously, it has actually effectively gone into liquidation um, uh, and, and no longer no longer exists. Um, so um, there you go, SVB. I hope that's been a useful um, little kind of synopsis of, you know, looking at a bank's balance sheet and just quite an interesting one because it's a it's a very different balance sheet to the normal banks um, uh, that we see. So hope you found it useful. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe um, to the channel. And I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Hello, thank you for watching that video. And I hope you found its contents useful. If you want to know more about what we do here at Talk Financials, you can find out on talkfinancials.com uh, where we uh, will explain how we design, develop and deliver training workshops for companies all over the world. Uh, we've worked with over 300 companies in over 35 countries around the world, uh, helping them to understand financial statements, to understand uh, business finance and to become fluent in the language of business finance. Uh, if you're interested in, in developing your own skills in how you read and interpret financial statements, um, I, I've developed an online workshop uh, which is available. All you've got to do is click on the QR code there, uh, point your camera at the QR code, um, and that will take you through to an online workshop uh, and it will help you to improve your own ability to read and interpret financial statements. Uh, I've also written a book called How to Talk Finance, uh, and again, that is available. Um, if you click on the QR code, it'll take you through to the Amazon website where you can buy the book either as a hard copy or as a Kindle edition. Um, and that's really everything from me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, it'd be great to stay in touch. If you'd like to contact me, um, then again, just click on the QR code um, uh, and send me a message. Uh, and good luck with uh, your financial analysis. I hope it goes well.